This is Game On, discussing the biggest games and all the latest sports news with Johnny Montabano and Hank and Dichter on the Empty the Bench Podcast Network. Time, folks. It's episode nine of Game On, presented by Nat here on the Empty the Bench Podcast Network. Johnny Montepano, Hank and Dick are with you on another busy, busy show. We're already at episode number nine, which is hard to believe, but we are here nevertheless. Hank, welcome. How are you? I'm uh, recovering, to say the least. Yeah, that's you know for sure. Why. Yeah. Oh, and we'll get into that. We had a, a great time Monday night discussing uh, doing a, a watch live watch along of the uh, Rangers and Pens. The outcome wasn't that great, but it was still a fun experience to be a part of. We'll uh, get into that series in just a moment. But folks, there's always you know plenty of ways to get aboard on the show. You can follow the show on Twitter at GameOnETB. Also, Facebook.com slash GameOnETB. And also, Instagram at GameOn underscore ETB. And you also can follow our personal handles. They are scrolling there on the bottom of your screen. Another jam-packed show on this in this uh, middle of May. We'll get into the basketball, the NBA playoffs, just wild right now. Uh, you know, in a bunch of different ways with all injuries. You know, we've got now head coaches testing positive for COVID. Uh, we've got series tied up. We've got a lot of ways to look at the NBA playoffs. We'll get into that. We will get into what I thought was an amazing. Uh, feet at the Kentucky Derby on Saturday as Rich Strike, who wasn't even entered into the race until Friday morning, uh, goes off at 80 to one, second biggest long shot winner of the Kentucky Derby in its 148th years. Uh, we will get into that. Uh, we got some football news as well. You know, we got some part of the NFL schedule released. We've also got Tom Brady announced that he's going to be joining Fox Sports after his playing day so we'll react to that so we have a lot to get to but you know hank and i still you can tell even in our voices a little bit we're still a little bit disappointed off of the off of game four of rangers pens and we'll get it going here with that series as well as the stanley cup playoffs in general and you know hank now you know a few hours after game four you look at this series and it started out You know, it started out great when you look at it because the Rangers jumped out in game one to a quick two goal lead. Unfortunately, we all know what happened with the non call or with the with the with the call of uh, the no goal and then a triple overtime loss. And the Rangers able to bounce back in game two. But these last two games down in Pittsburgh have been pretty tough from the Rangers side of things. So four games in Rangers now trailing three games to one against the Pens. A uh, few ways to look at this series. You know, I thought this was a series the Rangers were favored in. I thought they had a very, you know, they had a decent favorable matchup. There were two things that concerned me about the Rangers when we uh, were talking with Brian Atard of the Sports Box and Blue Truth uh, last time. And I think it's starting to rear its head. And that's been the Rangers' defense in front of Igor, which you definitely have seen has been a big problem. And I think in some ways the experience factor has also played into the series as well. So, you as the diehard Ranger fan, you know, I'm a Ranger fan too, but I would say you're more of a fan than I would. I'm not, I'm not afraid to admit that, but okay. you know, what's your uh, perspective here? Uh, four games in and now the Rangers uh, on the brink of elimination going into game five. Well, first and foremost, I think I need to address the elephant in the room and that that's like who gets the blame. Everyone is so quick to say that Gerard Gallant and Igor Shosturkin are the problems and the main reason as to why they lost. No. If you honestly think that Igor is the problem for what happened in games three and four, you really aren't paying attention because look, yeah. Was he great? No, I'm not going to sit here and try to tell you that he was great. And sure. There's probably a goal or two that he'd like to have back. I'll, I'll give you that. But with that being said, He can only do so much when his defense has practically been on a friggin' milk carton. When you have Patrick Nemeth taking penalties at the beginning of the game and leading to a power play goal, I'm sorry. That's where you can't blame Igor. Second of all, a lot of guys such as 
Mika Zibanejad, Chris Kreider. You haven't really seen a lot of them. Is that Gerard Gallant's fault? Uh, I think you got to blame the guys that are getting paid the money. But with that having been said, you know, this could potentially be a bad loss should the Rangers not pull a repeat of what they did in 2014 and come back from 3-1. and one. As bad as this would be, I'm not going to call this season a failure because, look, as bad as it is that they've been getting smoked a few times by the Penguins and giving up a lot of goals, and it's especially bad when you look at the fact that they're losing to a third-string goalie, there's a few things we have to put in perspective. Number one, this team's ahead of schedule. They weren't supposed to be this good this soon. And when you really looked at them and how they won their games, if it wasn't for Igor, like, you know, forget the fact that they won 50 games. Who, know, who knows if they would have even, like, had home, home ice advantage in the playoffs to begin with. So th- this was really the first season and the first, like, true test that a lot of this core is having together. And remember, some of them are pretty young. I'm not, like, going to act like the sky is falling, even though I am legitimately disappointed, especially at all, especially still feel disappointed should they fail to come back from three to one. But another thing you also have to remember is when you have a new core, sometimes it's better that they learn how to lose the hard way and then it may, it might, like, set them up for future runs. And, like, and if you look at past Stanley Cup winners, like, Most of them in their first years together, like in the Stanley Cup playoffs, they generally don't even get past the first round, let alone win the cup. So this isn't really anything unusual or new. It's just considering the way the regular season's gone, it's disappointing. Yeah, that's fair. And I get where you're coming from as far as the goaltending situation, because that's something I was very adamant about talking with Brian and talking with you about on episode eight is – you know, the Rangers, to me, had a, had a clear advantage in the goaltending. And, mm-hmm. you know, the numbers may not look at it, and if you're watching it, it may not look like that's the case. But I'm watching these games along with you, and what I see is that Igor is not having a chance in the world to make some of these oh. stops because you see – you saw the game even when we were watching game four, mm-hmm. how many times the Penguins were able to get two-on-ones, being able to make cross-ice passes for goals, uh, you know, how – You know, Sidney Crosby right in front of the net uh, is able to uh, poke that puck in for the first goal, which, by the way, they showed a uh, an angle online about it. And it turns out it actually was a legitimate good goal. So they got that call right at the end of the day, which is all you could really ask for. But I've seen the defense just in front of uh, Igor just, you know, completely fall apart. And I don't care. And, and I don't care if you're Igor, if you're Henrik Lundqvist, if you're Patrick Waugh, if you're the best goaltender in history, you're not making those saves. And I think one thing that hasn't really talked about, been talked about, not having Ryan Lindgren hurts. I think that's another – him and Barclay Goodrow, even though Barclay Goodrow is not a defenseman, you have to wonder if those injuries really are going to come back to hurt the Rangers should, should they end up losing this series. Well, it does put other players in spots that they didn't think they were going to be a part of. So it's certain- it's it's pretty much why it's why as much as everybody wants to see guys like Patrick Nemeth and maybe a Justin Braun not on the ice, like you don't have Ryan Lindgren. Lindgren, like what choice does he really have? There are no other choices yeah. in that regard. Maybe maybe you could call up like a Zach Jones or a Nils Lundqvist, but like, what's that I really going to do? Yeah, no, exactly. Those are like young minor leaguers. That's no, that kind of reeks of desperation. I mean, we yeah. saw Chris Kreider, you know, Chris Kreider began his Ranger career in the playoffs, but that's something totally different. But I'm just looking at the defense in front of in front of Igor just completely break down. And mm-hmm. you and I had spoken about this, too, on the on the watch along the Rangers inability to win a face off was just unbelievable in game four. I mean, what was it like the, the, it was like 21 to 11. It was like a dominant. Oh, they were, getting, uh, clobbered. They were, yeah, getting, they were clobbered. getting clobbered on the face offs too. I mean, they could not win a face off to save their life. And, you know, you were looking towards the experience factor and for the most part, the Ranger young players in the series have not been the problem. It's really been more the veteran guys. Like it was, like you said, the Stroms, the Criders, the Shabinichads, the, the Panarins of the world. 
have been the ones that have also been letting this team down. So it just comes down to that. As far as like, you know, special teams go, there have really haven't been that many power play chances for either team in this series. But when both teams have had power plays, for the most part, you've seen the Penguins take advantage of some. You've seen the Rangers have a couple. Uh, but I think it comes down to very simply just the fact that the Ranger defense in front of Igor has just completely fallen apart. And a lot of these goals, I don't think you can really blame him for in this series. And I had said that you have to watch out because I think Crosby, Malkin, Latang, and Gensel, they're going to make one f- big last push because this could be the last year that all four of those players are together with uh, with Malkin being a free agent at the end of the year. And, and I think not to mention Crosby's getting up there in years too. Yeah, and so you don't really know how much long this is going to last. And I'm not – I'm not going to take the route here of being as disappointed of losing to a third string goaltender because uh-huh. he's not been, let's be honest, Louis Domingue has not been that great. No. Yeah. The Rangers, because what it is, is that the Rangers are not peppering him enough. They only had, I think, well, they didn't have that many shots on goal in game four. A lot of the, the time was spent in their own zone playing defense. So I, I, and they, you've seen Domingue give up some bad goals in this series. And Tristan Jerry is working his way back. I really don't know. You know, he's he's had a pretty decent year, but I don't know if he's going to end up be, being a factor at all in this series. They're going to probably continue to ride Domingue. But if the Rangers lose this series, it's not a third-string goaltender outplaying a first-string possibly Vesna Trophy winner. It's I, I'm going to go out and say that if the Rangers lose this series, it's because the – Penguins veteran players outplayed the Rangers young defense, which I thought was a, which I thought was a, which was a concern to me entering the series on the Rangers side. And it's starting to look that way. So uh, as we sit here getting ready for game five on Wednesday night, I I think the Rangers will bounce back and I think they will win game five. I just don't know if you're going to see a repeat of 2014 or you're going to see a repeat of the 30 other instances in this, in the league where a team has come back from three games to one down. Uh, well, but- it's an entirely different. Well, with the exception of Chris Kreider, it's a mostly different group too. So yeah, I don't know. If, I don't really like hearing those comparisons because it's like, Oh, if such and such happened. No, it's, those are two different years. It's not really all that relevant, but if it does happen, then great. But I'm not going to say, Oh, this happened because so-and-so happened eight years ago. No. I guess the one other thing you could bring up too could be Gerard Gallant because this is a guy who's been in the playoffs before with the Golden Knights and with the Florida Panthers. And his biggest uh, weakness, I guess, could be not getting over the over the hump. And that could be a thing here too. And maybe that, you know, speaks, you know, I've heard some fans talk about how they want a John Tortorella-like approach, especially on defense. How they're not able to block shots and they're leaving Igor out to dry. But I think with – a capable guy like the lot, the Rangers don't get to this point either. Yeah, no, there's no, there's no way the Ranger here without Gerard Gallant. And again, that that's one guy that I really don't think you can criticize at all. He is, he has gotten the most out of the squad. He got, he got a 50 goal season out of Chris Kreider. He got other really good seasons from some of the rookies. And I, it's funny because some people accused him of like, hating on the young players for not giving them as much playing time. But if you look at history of the NHL, that's that's been a lot of coaches. So I thought he has done an exceptional job. And if they're going to bounce back in this series, I think one reason will be because of the end behind the bench. And you know what? Again, even if they don't, the, he still has done a great job in helping to get them one step into the new, into the new direction. And again, as, as we said, and I can't stress this, this enough, this team isn't quite at their window yet. I think maybe next year is going to be when you really start to see some progress. Maybe that's when they finally make that deep run in the playoffs. But like as great of a regular season as it was, like I'm not going to lie. There were some flaws. There were reasons why Brian and I expressed our concerns over the years about over the past season about the Rangers and why we thought as good as they could be, we weren't sure our like ex- expectation and hope was just at least one playoff series. Cause like, as we said, it's still a young group. You still want to see what they can do. And I think really next year you'll see how they can improve. 
Yeah, and is there anything that you think that, you know, you, you were saying a couple of minutes ago about possibly, you know, making a couple of roster moves, but really, is there anything the Rangers can do roster-wise that to shake things up like we've seen maybe some teams do uh, in the in the playoffs to try and light a spark? I don't really think there anything is. They've already committed also to saying that Igor is going to start game five, which I think, you know, makes a total makes total sense. But I don't yeah. really – there's nothing really they can do roster-wise to – shake things up that I think is going to make much of a difference. No, I don't think so. I mean, Igor is the guy that's, well, we'll definitely win the Vezina after, after the season he was without him. You don't even forget the fact that, that, that they won 50, who, who knows how far they would have gone with, without Igor. He was an important member of this team. And I would argue probably the most valuable player. I don't know whether this is a case of him getting burnt out or whatnot, or whether, or I think it was more had more to do with the bad defense. But at the end of the day, Igor was was your horse that pretty much got you this far. You might as well just ride him out for better for worse. Yeah, eighty three shots on goal in game one that he had to face. I mean, and he still had one of the highest saves in single and single Rangers playoff game in history, and he still had a pretty high save percentage of the first few games, like. Yeah, are, we sure, are we really sure for those blaming him, him, like, again, you're out of your mind. Yeah. And I don't want to hear, you know, either Ranger fans or Penguin fans telling me after the game, uh, after the series ends that, oh, they lost to a third string goaltender. That's not the reason why the Rangers lost the series or, or would lose the series if that did. No, they happen. lost because Gensel, Malkin and Crosby, they have been there before. They have been had many a clutch moment. They've won cups. And, yeah, this is where the experience matters. Yeah, and so we'll find out if the Rangers can uh, at least win game five, make it to a six, and who knows what could happen from there. But, Hank, you look at the rest of the Stanley Cup playoffs real quick. You know, after the Ranger game last night, while the game was going on, I ended up tuning into the end of the uh, Panthers and Capitals, and, boy, what a crazy finish that one was. Uh, the Caps were up 2-1. to one. Late third period, they had a chance for an empty netter to put it away, and it goes wide, and then the Panthers come right down with about two minutes to go in the third to tie it up, force overtime, and they end up winning in overtime to tie that series up. And I'll tell you, that series, I had said that I thought the Capitals could really pull off an upset, and it was there for them to go up three games to one in that series. But the Panthers give them credit. You know, they make it a brand-new series and are able to tie that series up at two. And you look at the rest of these series, and now outside of really the Avalanche and, and the Predators, which uh, Colorado swept them after winning five to three, you've got the rest of these series, the Calgary, Dallas, and then the four series happening tonight, all tied at two. You know, Hurricanes, uh, Bruins, which I never thought that series would be tied up at two, Lightning, Maple Leafs, Blues, Wild, and Kings, Oilers. So as if you're just a regular old hockey fan, uh, you're, you're set up for some – uh, exciting action here in the playoffs. Yeah, no, the only series that I pretty much knew was going to be a short series was the Colorado national one. And as I predicted, that one ended up being a four game Colorado sweep there on the next round. That's a team that's going to be pretty dangerous, but yeah, I mean, it's weird. A lot of these playoff games have been blowouts, but for the most part, they've, they've been pretty evenly matched two to two. I think I knew Tampa was going to bounce back against the uh, Toronto Maple Leafs and Wow, Florida with that comeback. I think Florida probably will win the series because look, that was a missed opportunity the Capitals had. You're up two to one. You have you have the other team's net netminder pulled, can't take advantage, and then you have to have the other team tied. And look, Florida was a team that had the best record in the regular season. That's a pretty bad loss. Like I know, I know Washington's had the experience with Alexander Ovechkin, but can't help but think of that as a missed opportunity. Yeah, for sure. You know, I saw that that puck go wide, and you see Carolina—I mean, not Carolina, Florida—has to come right back and score and tie it up almost right afterwards. And you know, that's a, that alters the series now. Instead of Caps going up three to one and thinking they might pull this off, now it's tied up at two, and it becomes a best of three going back down to Florida. And now the uh, now it looks like the uh, Panthers have it in command. And I was also surprised about you know the Hurricanes and and the Bruins because Carolina. Jumped out so fast, 2-0 series lead, dominated the Bruins like they had all season long. But the Bruins bounced back, and now that's a best of three. So these are these series are, you know, if you're just a regular old sports fan and you want some, uh, you know, excitement, you know, these playoffs are, are going to 
you know, deliver that. Along oh, yeah, for sure. I didn't, Carolina, Boston, that's a series that has been very intriguing. I, I, I was surprised that – kind of surprised that Boston found a way to tie the series, but that was a big third-period outburst. And, by the way, on a side note, Tony D'Angelo throwing a stick. Gee, ever wonder why the Rangers got rid of that guy? <laughs> and ever wonder why Ranger fans like me were happy to see him go, even if it even was for nothing? By the way, this, that that Hurricanes team's got a few Rangers on it. Yeah, Tony D, Derek Stepan, Jesper Foss, Brendan Smith, yeah. Brady, yeah, uh, Brady Shays. I think Brady it's there. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. They don't really make up most of their core, but they've been key contributors. Tr- yeah, key absolutely. contributors for that run. Absolutely. One other hockey note I want to bring up real quick before we move on, Hank, because this came out of really nowhere yesterday or on Monday was the news of Barry Trotz being fired by the uh, Islanders, and. Mm-hmm. You know, when you look at the success that Trotz had, you know, after winning the Stanley Cup with Washington and going over to Long Island and, you know, seeing where the Islanders were in his first few years there, I mean, he made back-to-back appearances in the third round, and then this season he was fired off a year where, when you look at it, it was a year that the Islanders started out 13 games away on the road before they opened up the new UBS arena out there in Elmont. Shout out to my hometown, by the way, of Elmont, because <laughs> uh, now we're put on the we're put on the map at least forty one more times per year. But I, I, this one surprised me because if you look at the Islanders' season this year, you know they really only have you look at that and you look at that roster. They really have one capable goal scorer in Matt Barzell, and this was a team that played their first thirteen games on the road, like I said, and also was hit by COVID. And I understand that teams were hit, but let's be honest. And I, and I say this just as an impartial fan, the Islanders were screwed the most this year from COVID because they had, I think, eight guys at one point hit the COVID list. And instead of their games being, you know, suspended or, you know, paused down the road, they were forced to play some of those games with pretty much the Brit, the Bridgeport roster. So I don't really know how you were able to overcome that. And I don't think the Islanders ever were able to get overcome that because they put themselves in such a deep hole. But – Considering that they have one of, if not the best GMs in all of sports and Lou Amarillo, and, you know, like we, like we said, you know, the 13-game road trip and the COVID situation, I was really surprised they didn't keep Trotz to try and turn this thing around. Yeah, no. I mean, for one thing, it's not as surprising as you might think because if you look at his time with the New Jersey Devils, Lou has had a history of firing coaches probably, like, too soon after like one disappointing season but at the same time when you look at the big picture and in a vacuum no it's it i don't really think it's a smart move i mean let let's be real barry trotz pretty much squeezed the most he could out of this islander team he won the jack adams award his first year got them to the second round and then back to back years took them to the conference finals both of those teams gave the Lightning major headaches. They, In fact, I think they were really the one major threat that the Tampa Bay Lightning had in their back-to-back Stanley Cup runs. And then this year, like you said, they had a lot of situations that they couldn't couldn't really control. Now, granted, I'm not 100% sure that this was a playoff team even before the season because when you look at that roster top to bottom, the only really su- real superstar that they have is Matt Barzell. And then they have a solid goalie in Ilya Sorokin. So I th- I think I thought they were due to regress one way or another. But when you have the whole like COVID breakdowns and, and the Bridgeport rosters on the ice, I don't think you can really blame Barry Trotz, even if you disagree with how he assembled his lines at certain point in the season. He was he was probably the best coach that the Islanders had since Probably Al Arbor because Jack Capuano only really won one playoff series and but he never really went as far as Barry Trotz did. So, yeah, it's got to be Al Arbor. And that they're really the only two coaches now in history, if, if you even, if you don't at all, have been successful. So, yeah, I think it's definitely a surprise, but I don't think it'll be too long before he finds work again. I think, if anything, he's probably going to end up going to the New Jersey Devils. That's a team that has a good offense but is in need of defensive structure. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, you always trust Lamarillo to get the call right. As I said, I think he's one of the best GMs in sports. But, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, that, that's a team that's going to have to go through some transition uh, right now. And we'll find out if they do just that. I just thought when that news broke on Monday morning, uh, it was 
a bit, a bit of a, a bit of a shocker, especially considering where the island, what happened to the island this, this season. Like we said, you know, starting out on the road and then the COVID situation, which they probably were hampered by more than any other team, and mm-hmm. you know the injuries that they had too, tough to overcome, and not really being able to get a big player come deadline time. Uh, and it's unfortunate that Trotz takes the hit of that. But I agree with you. I think it'll only be a matter of time before he ends up coaching again, just because he is a two-time Jack Adams uh, award winner. So I, he'll he'll find he'll find a spot somewhere down the road. I just thought it was a bit surprising of how this happened so quick too, regarding the Islanders. But uh, switching gears, Hank, let's uh, get a little NBA playoffs into the course of the conversation here because they have been absolutely wild. As we are now down to the final eight teams, and you know there's been a theme to the playoffs here, Hank, and that has been injuries to big players and big spots. And you look at these series that are going on right now, and we'll start with the two games that happened on Monday as the Celtics got past the Bucks 116-108, to 108, and that series is now tied at two apiece. And, you know, this has been a series that I thought could go pretty long when you look at it. You know, you had Giannis on the Bucks, you know, really playing without his number two guy and Chris Middleton for – uh, the playoffs so far, you know, they've gotten contribution from Grayson Allen. But if you look at this series now, I think the one thing you're starting to realize is Giannis is there. They're, the Bucks are relying a lot on Giannis, while the Celtics have, yeah. you know, Jason Tatum and, and others that can contribute as well. So this is starting to look to me like a situation here where the Celtics could take advantage of Giannis because he doesn't have his second guy. And I think the Celtics now are in prime position to um, to get out of this series. Oh, yeah, no, that's a really scary thought. I mean, I was looking at that game while we were, like, watching the Rangers last night. And it seemed to me that, like, the Bucks, like, they were having that big lead, but then the Celtics kind of came back. And, you know, I think it definitely helps that the Celtics don't really have that one guy that they're, like, really focused on, whereas – with the Bucks, you knew that you knew losing Middleton would hurt at a certain point in the playoffs. But now, though, I think it's starting to rear its ugly head. And if the Celtics win game game five at Boston Garden, like I think, then the that's when the Bucks will really be in trouble. I know game six will be in Milwaukee. You, you get where I'm coming from this. Yeah, and uh, last night in game four, not only is it Jason Tatum putting up putting up thirty points, but it's Al Horford who went 11 to 14 from the from the field and he scored 30 turning back the clock a little bit but you know the Celtics I think just have better all-around players you know it's not just Tatum and Horford it's Jalen Brown it's Marcus Smart yeah the injury to uh Robert Williams we found out last night he did not play but you know you've got four guys on the Celtics side where on the Bucks if you don't have Giannis you know you're relying on on who exactly you know is it Grayson Allen, I mean, he can't keep it going. Or Drew Holiday, who had an off shooting night, he went five of twenty-two shooting. So to me, you know, the Celtics are a deeper team now. While Giannis was, you know, finalist for the MVP, uh, this is a situation where you know you've got Tatum, who's been playing out of his mind, and a deeper uh, lineup for Boston's side. And I think now you're starting to see if Giannis, they're relying on Giannis too much, and if he doesn't have his second guy, which we would think that it would be Middleton if he didn't sprain his, he hurt his MCL uh, a lot of pressure being put on Giannis and I think the Celtics are realizing that they could shut him down and not have to worry about a second player where if you're on Boston side you've got smart you've got like I said you've got Tatum you've you've got you know even how Al, Al Horford turning back the clock Jalen Brown I mean that's a pretty deep deep team and a spot for the Celtics here now where that series is tied at two and I think now they've got the advantage going back in the game five. Yeah, definitely. Especially with it going back, back home to Boston for them in front of that parquet floor. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> in shape. And, it's, and also last night, the Warriors got past the Grizzlies 101 to 98 to take a three, one series lead there. Uh, that was a, some drama before the game. You know, we were on again, doing the, uh, doing the Ranger watch along. And mm-hmm. during the game, you know, we were checking our uh, mobile, our phones and the computers and everything to see if anything else is happening while the game's going on. And the news broke last night that Steve Kerr tested positive for COVID. So Mike Brown, who is going to be named head coach of the Kings, still on the Warriors' uh, sideline, he ended up stepping in and 
and won the game. But it wasn't an easy win for for the Warriors last night. You know, they were having a tough time shooting. They were yeah. down 12 in the fourth quarter and rallied late. And obviously, we know on the Grizzlies side, no John Moran, another you know another big player missing missing a game with an injury, and they don't know even if he's going to be back for Game Five. And I tell you, look at this Warriors team. And, you know, even on an off shooting night, being able to come back from 12 down in the fourth quarter, I, I think the Warriors actually can really challenge the Suns and make it, make, make another deep run. You know, whether it's Curry, you know, Clay Thompson, him being back, you know, Jordan Poole's been a spark this year. Draymond Green, you know, say what you want about his antics, but he had a huge block shot late last night. Yeah. And the block, and that, that was the, that was what sealed the deal. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So even without Steve Kerr and, you know, when Kerr had his, uh, he was out for a while, a couple of years back and Brown had stepped in and the Warriors went 11 and 0 in Kerr's absence. This team to me is so locked that even on an off shooting night from mo most of their staff and coming back from 12 down, I, I think the Warriors can make a deep, could definitely challenge the Suns here uh, out, out in the West. Oh yeah. 100%. You got, that's a pretty deep roster too. Like when you got Steph Curry, Draymond, Clay Thompson, Jordan Poole, and I think that this was the game. If if they go into the go to the finals and possibly even win win the whole thing, this is the game that I'm going to look at as the game that like showed me that they that they were for real. And let me tell you why. Because the first half, I believe their shooting percentage was in the 30s. No, yeah, it wasn't that great. And only the shot forty percent of the game. The crazy thing is, they were only down by three, so it was an uncharacteristically off night. And I was texting one of my friends last night. She was watching the game with me. She is one of the. She has been a diehard Warrior fan since like before they got really good with Steph Curry and Clay Thompson. Like I can see why she was she was getting worried about their chances, but then uh, as somebody who's seen them like from afar, like as a casual like NBA fan, I I could I had a feeling they were going to bounce back. And the reason being is if you look at a lot of these games, it's the superstars that usually come up clutch that lead their teams to a big win. And that's what Steph Curry did. He had a big second half and was a huge reason for them coming back to win this game. And then not to mention the other reason I pretty much knew they were going to win this game was they were pretty much down all game, but the Grizzlies and probably and it was probably because they didn't have John Morant, they could never truly put away the Warriors. And when you can't put away the Warriors, you can only keep your lead for a certain amount of time before Steph Curry and Clay Thompson and the boys just start to go off, you know? Definitely. And the Grizzlies shot nine of thirty-five from three, the Warriors nine of thirty-seven. And you know, the injury to, to Morant, you know, it's been a it's been a trend in the entire postseason for a lot of these teams. It's been a star player missing time because of injury. And I know we're going to get some more in just a moment. But the other big thing with the series so far has been, you know, the antics of Draymond Green, uh, the uh, injury to uh, Gary Payton. Uh, so, you know, we've, we've it's been a very physical series. You know, we've had some flagrant fouls, which have been questionable, we, even in the the Buck and Celtic game last night, you had, you know, technical fouls, which were very questionable calls at best. So, yeah, it, you know, on an off shooting night for most of these guys in this game, the fact that the Warriors are able to come back and pull this off. And like you said, you know, they were down 12 in the fourth and Curry then just goes off. You know, he scores 32. Uh, you know, Clay Thompson's been great since he's come back. Jordan Poole's been a spark as well. And even Andrew Wiggins has given you something. And Draymond Green defensively, he's he's been there to, you know, provide that defense, and that's that's why he's there, antics and all. You know, he's a very clutch defensive player. He does the role player kind of things that help teams win championships. So, to me, the Warriors are a dangerous team to go pretty far, and I think the reason why I give the Warriors a good chance to even get past the Suns here is you look in that other series that's going on right now between the uh, the, the Mavericks and the Suns, you know, the Ma it, this is a series that I thought the Phoenix needed to – put it away early and now it's going to go at least six and you know about the injury history with Chris Paul you know about Devin Booker who's coming who came back from a hamstring injury and now the the Mavericks are giving the Suns uh, a, a pretty good test out there in the West yeah absolutely I think Dallas can very well steal this series bit with the play of Luka Doncic and 
be interesting to see what happens there. But I think even if Phoenix still finds a way to win the series, which I think they will, I think they're definitely going to struggle with the Golden State Warriors win or lose. There's no way that series goes at least. There's no way. There's no way that series goes less than six or seven. Yeah, and it's just you, what you've seen is this. What what really helped the Suns get to this point now? They're starting to have some struggles with, and that you could you could say could be you know turnover wise, but I also think like you said the the play of Doncic has also been a big factor for Dallas and why they've been able to get to this point. You know, the Suns took the first two games and Dallas took the last two to make this now a best of three. Uh huh. Yeah, absolutely. I I think it. I. Really excited to see how that goes the rest of the way. I think I think Phoenix is going to end up winning this, but ultimately it's going to go in seven. Well, one of the things they're going to have to do is 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 you know stop turning the ball over. I mean they've they've committed uh, seventeen turnovers in three straight games, and that's something weren't doing a lot during the regular season was the turnover. And then also their shooting percentage has gone down a bit. You know they shot fifty percent or better in their first eight games in this playoff. And in the last two, they've shot less than 50%. So it's really just starting the little things. And, you know, when you're turning the ball over and you're shooting under 50% in this NBA, you know, you're not going to get it done. And Doncic, who's now averaging 33 points, uh, nine rebounds, and just about nine assists as well, is uh, is pulling it out. But I agree with you. I think the uh, Suns are going to bounce back. It might take six or seven, and that may ultimately lead to an advantage because I, I think the Warriors are going to put away the – the Grizzlies in five. We don't know the situation yet regarding Devin, uh, excuse me, regarding John Morant. But if Morant's not out there on the floor, I mean, let's be honest, the Grizzlies have no chance. Uh, that that's what it comes down to. And you know, we will uh, we'll we'll find out. I, I like I said, I think the Suns are very deep too. I mean, they're very very talented. We know about Devin Booker. We know about Chris Paul. We know about Bridges. I mean, all, you know, Eaton. They've got they've got a lot of guys on that team, but. Uh, so do so do the Warriors, and the Warriors might have rest on their side, which could be a huge thing, especially considering the injury problems that the Suns have had. So it could be a situation with you know two of the best teams out west that could go towards the uh, the Warriors' favor. And as far real quick, and and we'll get and this other series, this has been another fascinating one: the Heat and the Seventy uh, Sixers, and we we all know the situation regarding Joel Embiid and. Uh, boy, I, I didn't see this coming. You know, the, the heat jumped out fast, and we didn't think that Embiid would come back as quick as he did, but he's come back, and he's 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 given a spark to the 76ers team. Yeah, that's the guy that I thought should have won the most valuable player award. He is the guy – He he's the, the glue that pretty much carries the Philadelphia 76ers, and I would have to give – I think I think they're going to come back and win the series. Honestly, I think they're such a different team without Joel Embiid. I mean, you saw James Harden at this point is not a guy that can really lead the team all by himself. Well, he's he's also given them a spark too because he's bounced back in a big way these last couple of games. But the presence of Embiid, considering what he's playing through, whether it's the thumb issue or now the facial uh, injury, and what he's been able to give you. Uh, Truly, truly a remarkable uh, thing there for the Sixers. And like you said, you know, I think I think they could come back in the series. Just the presence alone of uh, Joel Embiid uh, could be something that really gives the Sixers a spark. And you've, you've seen that these last two games. Yeah, definitely. And by the way, going back to the Phoenix Suns, Dallas Mavericks series, mm -hmm. we got to talk about that Chris Paul story. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like, yes. You go ahead. I'm sorry. What is he? He he gets banned from American Airlines Center for giving unwanted hugs to his family, and then he tries to pick a fight. When will these guys ever learn that you just don't try to like do stuff like that to NBA superstars? Yeah, it's, it's unfortunately this is starting to become a growing trend in basketball and almost all sports, but especially in basketball, you hear these stories of uh, you know we we saw this story break. We've seen. You know, the antics towards uh, Kyrie, but that was really more a serenation than anything, which is fine. But, yeah, how many times have you seen in the NBA this this season uh, stories about fans and, you know, players? And, yeah, this one was totally different because, you know, you got a fan that's coming up to Chris Paul's family and giving them hugs un unnecessarily. And, you know, good kudos to the American Airlines Center for banning him for at least a year. I mean, it should be – it should, should be, be longer. Life. Yeah, it should be for life, but – 
um, yeah, I, I, I don't know what really the, the answer to all this is. That's, that's the problem. You know, we were talking about this uh, before our watch along last night and I, I don't know what you really can do. I mean, you're not going to uh, ban fans from, you know, you're not going to have play in front of an empty stadium. That's, that's something you're not going to do. It's uh it's a tough, it's, it's a tough call here, but yeah, it's just, I don't get why this is happening. You know, post COVID we're seeing these instances, whether it's here in basketball or, you know, the incident we saw with Miles Straw and the Yankees and the guardians earlier this season at the stadium. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's disgusting. It's, uh, it's sad. You know, you try and go, you know, these guys are spending, you know, you spend a lot of money to go to these games and, I don't know. That's part of it too, and just the, the behavior is just you know it's inexcusable. It's uh, it's it's bad. It's it's yeah. It's tough. Well, yeah, and then I kept hearing people stories that people were behaving like this because you know they were stuck in their houses for a lot, so they must. I don't know what it is, but either way, it's got to stop. Yeah, the whole COVID thing angle to this because I, I brought that up too. You know, for. Since COVID, I feel like society has just gotten crazier, and I don't know if it has to do with you know being stuck at home for two years or whatnot. But why these instances are happening? We're hearing stories of more about fans and stands and stuff post COVID. I, I I don't know what it is. I, I really don't, and I don't know what really you can do. Like, what do you? What can you possibly do? I mean, you're going to just have more security surround you know certain parts of the arena. I mean, that could be a case, but. You know, this I remember earlier in the season, you know, the story of, you know, the situation with LeBron James. And, you know, I know our executive producer, Nick Morgan, is going to kill me for saying this, but I'm going to say this. <laughs> the way that LeBron, uh, LeBron James, the way that that uh, he handled that by just pointing the fan out and asking to, to get security and getting him to leave is really the answer. If, you know, you can pinpoint the fan that's doing what, what's going on. I think the best way you can do it is, you know, stop the game, go to the official, tell them what's happening, get security, and get the fan out. I think the way that LeBron had that earlier in the season was the right thing. Yeah, yeah. Because there's got to be, you know, you got there's got to be some, you know, thing that has to be done. You know, the banning the banning of the fan is a start. I mean, that could be it too, but. Uh, but yeah, no. I mean, if the athlete, I've always said, you know, athletes need to be bigger than the fans to a degree, but at the same time, you know, if it ends up being that way, then don't charge the fan. Don't yell at the fan. You know, I think the way that LeBron handled that situation earlier this season is the correct decision. You know, if you have to stop the game, tell the official to to go tell security and go point the fan out and get the fan out. I mean, that's really the way to do it. I I, I really do. Especially when you, uh, these situations are um, unfortunately still becoming a, a story and something that we keep talking about. By the way, let me just piggyback real quick to that Heat series as well. One other thing to watch for as you know, game five tonight, Kyle Lowry out again for the Heat with a hamstring injury. You know, he came back from the hamstring and he ended up re-aggravating it, and that's another big blow. And I think that also gives the Sixers an advantage in that series. So and B come back with his presence. You know, James Harden, if he goes off for what he what he did before, I think you you're looking at a very good uh chance that the Sixers come back from down 0-2 and upset the Heat. Yeah, I th- I think they're going to do it. I think getting Joel Embiid back gave them like a new new lease on life. And you pretty much see why we think this is a guy who should have been the MVP. And actually, if I'm being honest, I probably would have put – I probably would have even picked Giannis over Nikola Jokic, but that's another tangent for another day. Yeah, I, I don't think you could have gone wrong with either choice as Jokic does win the MVP for the second straight year. Uh, Monty Williams won Coach of the Year uh, out there in Phoenix. Uh, I think I was the right choice too. But I don't think uh, – you could have made a case for all three guys uh, in the MVP discussion, whether it's, it was Embiid, Giannis, or Jokic. I think he, all of them have cases to make. And I, I, wasn't, I wasn't against Jokic – Winning. I mean, maybe I'm a little bit more biased because I'm more of an Eastern Conference guy. Obviously, being a Knicks fan, I could see that. But, uh, but yeah, no, Jokic wins it for the second straight year. But we've got four very good series now, also in the NBA, that are starting to run, run wind down. And uh, who knows? By this point next week, we might have our conference final set up. It's just so weird. You know, the only thing about the NBA playoffs that I just can't stand, and this has been a constant, it just seems like it takes forever. I mean, it feels like they the, the playoffs have been around for two months, and we're still only you know, more than halfway through the second round. 
Yeah, they tend to drag on. They really do. There was a stretch in the Bucks Celtics series that they went four game four days in between games. And here's hockey who plays every other day. Especially after a triple overtime game. Just saying. I mean, hockey athletes, I tell you, they're the uh they're definitely some of the best uh, guys in they're the, the best. They're the best. You know, they don't take they don't take uh load management days. You know, maybe they take maintenance days when they're practicing, but not when they uh are you know, out there on the ice. I mean, they, they play every day and they play through a lot of things. So. Yeah. This, this is one of the many reasons why I prefer the Stanley cup playoffs. Well, not so much because the Stanley cup playoff can like be more intense and fast paced, but like you never see too many of this load management. They're just, they're just tough guys. Honestly, like guy gets hit. You see Barkley Goodrow getting hit, like blocking a shot. Plays like four overtimes with a broken ankle. Unfortunately, because of that broken ankle, he couldn't play the remainder of the series. But the fact that he even played four, played overtimes with that, that's – what does that tell you? Yeah, and Stanley Cup playoffs to me are more unpredictable than the NBA playoffs. I mean, for the most part, you're seeing in the NBA right now, the teams that have the best talented players and the best teams are moving on. I mean, you might see that if the, – the exception to that, if the Heat don't get past the Sixers. But um, at this point, it's usually the best in the – you don't really see that eight one upset like you could see in hockey in the NBA playoffs, but you know, it'd be exciting run down the stretch. And we're going to try in the next episode or two to do an NBA round table as the uh, playoffs roll on. But Hank, speaking of, uh, but switching gears here, uh, I want to talk, I want to talk about the Kentucky Derby because, you know, I'm, I'm a big horse racing guy. You know, I watch the big ones, you know, I grew up five minutes away from Belmont park on long Island and minutes away from, uh, from Aqueduct, and you know, my brother, one of my brothers lives in Saratoga, close mm-hmm. to Saratoga, so you know about that. Uh, this was incredible, set, and I know your attention was mostly on the Ranger game because this race went off just minutes before the start of Game Three. But Rich Strike winning the 148th Kentucky Derby. You know, this was a field. I'll tell you, you know, what was interesting. I was going to message you before the the start of this race because there was a horse that was named Messier. Messier. Yes. Yeah, they named it after Mark Messier. Oh man! The now you know why the horse really didn't have a chance, though. Why? Because he didn't draw post position eleven. Oh! I was like, wait a second. If your horse is named Messier, how do you not draw post position eleven? I know that makes no sense. Right? I was like, well, that's not that's not going to work. And then if, if Messier is not going to win, that means that the Rangers are not going to win Saturday night. So it didn't wasn't really looking and panning out there. But this was incredible because you know Rich Strike who was on the also eligibles list. Now this was something recent that the Kentucky Derby did. It was usually always just 20 horses. And if somebody got scratched, then you get down to 19 or so, but they also added two horses to the also eligibles list in case there was a scratch. And that's what happened. Ethereal road was scratched on Friday. And so rich strike drew in off the also eligible list on Friday morning. So this is a horse that did not even know it was going to race in this race until 36 hours or so beforehand, and so many things with this, you know, he draws post position 20, which had only fielded one winner in the first 147 runnings of the run of the roses. And he goes off at 80 to one and ends up pulling off the upset. And it's amazing also, because if you watch the replay of it, as they're entering the stretch, he's far behind. And makes an unbelievable stretch run to upset Epicenter and Zenden to win this race. So, so many incredible things with this race and with Rich Strike winning it. I mean, he made a lot of people rich, pun intended. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 85, what was it? 85 to 1 odds? It was 80 to 1, the second biggest, uh, the second longest shot in Kentucky Derby history, second biggest payout. I think he paid out like five hundred dollars to win or something like that. It was absolutely amazing. Wow. Well, Johnny, you can't predict horse racing. No, you can't, especially on a twenty horse field. I mean, it, it's it's that's why I like the Derby because you know not only is it the you know the fact that you got over a hundred thousand people there at Churchill Downs or mm-hmm. it's uh, you know it's one of the three legs of the Triple Crown. It's always special to me because, like I said, you know Belmont Park. If you've ever got a Triple Crown contender, I mean, it's the one day per year. In the past, at least, it was the one day of the year my hometown got put on the map. But, yeah, it, it, this is amazing because 
again, this was a horse that we didn't even talk about until 36 hours beforehand. And if you're watching the pre-race coverage like I was, they were the analysts were saying they could not find a way that they could see this horse winning. Yeah, no, that's unreal. Yeah, and so of that. Yeah, no, it really is an unreal, an unbelievable situation. Uh, so the second longest shot, the second time a horse won from the twenty position, uh, a lot of first, and you know, now we'll see. We don't know yet if Rich Strike is committed to the Preakness States over there at Pimlico in Maryland in two weeks on the twenty first. Uh, even if Rich Strike does race in the Preakness, is not going to go off as the favorite. They're already talking about there could be four or five horses favored more. And you're not going to have a lot of the horses that raced in the Derby go to go to the Preakness. And so that could be also serving as a disadvantage. I don't know if you're really going to see a triple crown winner in horse racing this year. But the, this this to me really is just like, you know, it, it really it, – it garnered the attention not only of horse racing fans but really just the sport fan in general because it just speaks to, you know, what we talk about in sports, you know, any given day with uh, professional teams. And this was almost like this. This was like your 16 over the one in the in March Madness, or your eight over the one in the NBA or NHL, or you know that team that just barely sneaks in in the baseball playoffs. Or that one wild card team. I was gonna say that one wild card team you least expect. Yeah, it would be the 2011 Cardinals. Yeah, that that could be it. You know, even the 06 Cardinals who won 83 games and got and won the World Series that year. But an amazing thing over there, at Churchill Downs. I mean, they finally had a full. Uh, crowd, I think they said it was like 150,000 there at, in Kentucky for this race. And, you know, Rich Strike, again, doesn't does not get entered in until Friday morning and, you know, draws and ends up drawing, you know, the 20 post position because Ethereal Road was scratched. And, mm-hmm. you know, it, the, when you watch the race, it, it was incredible because the pace of it in the beginning was so unbelievably quick that you knew the favorites were going to tie her out and the favorites were, you know, up in the front early on so when you're watching the race in real time and you're seeing how fast they're going all right and you're saying you're thinking to yourself at real time or at least i'll tell you what i was thinking is you know there there could be a chance that we see something special here now i didn't think it was going to be this kind of special but when you're drawing you know i, don't, I know you're not the biggest horse racing up but when you're going 45 and change for a half mile in a, in a mile and a quarter race uh that's that's a hard pace to keep up and rich strike ended up you know making a like I said, you know, made his move around the turn, was still far behind, and then had an incredible ride down the inside and able to pull this off at 80 to 1. Uh, this will be something that horse racing fans will be talking about for a long, long time. We'll find out what happens. The Preakness is on the 21st, and then the Belmont Stakes will be three weeks after that. Three big races in the Triple Crown in horse racing. Just had to bring that in there because, you know, just, an, um, just not only the upset, but how it happened and the history behind the 148 runnings of this race. And it's only the second t- this is the second biggest upset and the second time the horse won from post position number 20. But, Hank, wrapping up the show here, uh, let's get into a little football. Uh, you know, the big news that broke this morning was that Fox Sports CEO uh, LaShawn uh, Murdoch announced that Tom Brady is going to join Fox Sports as an ambassador and he's going to be the lead uh, color commentator for uh, Fox in their number one group with Kevin Burkhardt. And we found out that Burkhardt's going to be the number one guy because Joe Buck's going to ESPN. So in the future, the uh, sports media landscape is going to be changing here. But, you know, I kind of a, kind of a surprise, but also not really much of a surprise because we know how much Tom Brady loves football. I mean, it only took him 39 days to realize how much he really misses to come back. But – uh, what less, are your, time, what, less time than it took for a lockout to end. Good old Rob Manfred. Good old Rob. Oh, we, there's our one Rob, I good old Rob Manfred phone with every show. I After, couldn't, I couldn't is. that opportunity. I'm sorry. You, oh, I, I know. <laughs> I, it's, I totally get it. I mean, there's always something to it. But, uh, but Hank, what's your thoughts about Tom Brady um, going to Fox Sports? I, you know what? I think that makes sense. I think he has a great personality and I think he's a natural fit and it should be interesting to see how that plays out. Although personally, I hope that happens sooner rather than later because, you know, aren't, aren't you, I'm sure you and I, you like me are pretty tired of seeing him like keep on dominating, but you know what? 
it is what it is. I'm not that bitter. My team, be, our team, beat him in a Super Bowl twice, even though that kind of feels like missing memory. Ab- absolutely, Hank. I mean, that's you know, we have to say that as Giant friends, a uh, Giant fans, I don't have a problem with Brady's continuing success because you know what, we stopped yep. him from being a total complete dynasty. Um, twice. Yeah, that would have been the. Well, I don't. Dynasty. I don't have a problem if he wants to go out there and keep winning. You know what? Let him do it because you're not. You're not going to see this again in. I, I would go on record of saying you will not see this again in really any sport. The perfect example right now in football is look at Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs. You know, he he's gone to the AFC championship game four times in a row and he's won and he's been to one Super Bowl. No, two. Two. That's he's awesome. won one. He's been to two, but I'm I'm sorry, he's only won one Super Bowl in those four trips. And now he's got an AFC West that is absolutely stacked. Where he people, remember when people were talking about the Chiefs being the next dynasty, and um, that that pretty much got shut down pretty quickly. And I think it's going to be so difficult to do that now because you've got the extra playoff game, and you've also got the the extra playoff teams and the extra regular season game. So mm-hmm. you're almost going to need like a bye week during the season, in addition to the bye week you're going to get in general to to pull it off. So we're not going to see what Brady's done, I think, ever again. You know, you're not seeing that really in any pro sport. You don't, you're not seeing teams duplicate a repeat. You're seeing what the Lightning are doing in hockey. That's like the closest thing right now. Mm-hmm. And that, that's pretty much it. The only thing, the only thing that you really see like dynasties or stuff happening is in college sports, really college football, because you know you're seeing what the Alabamas of the world are doing uh, year over year. Uh, but you don't really see it happen that much in, in, in sports because of free agency and now the long seasons and the way that the games are changing in general. So if Brady wants to go, wants to make one more run. And I think he's got a very capable shot of doing that in the in, with the bucks this year, because the NFC has gotten a lot worse. Let's, let's, let's be real. Who's really his competition in the NFC this year. It's the Packers. Maybe the uh the rams the defending champs and you know i'm still looking for somebody else look at his division to the nfc south you know the panthers really have don't have much quarterback they don't know much of a team the saints are still rebuilding the falcons you know i told you i told you on uh review and preview i think the falcons are going to be the worst team in football this year so yeah, he's, no, he's, in, he's in a favorable division brady only needs to play at 50 percent the quarterback that he's been before Even the Falcons, I don't even think they had a good draft either, but yeah, you're right. Yeah. I mean, he only has to be at 50% of the, of the person that he's been before and they still might pull off 11 or 12 wins. Yep. Sounds about right. Not really much competition in that division. Like you said, Falcons are probably, well, yeah, as I said, I think the Falcons probably were one of those teams that just came out like a dud in the draft. The Panthers, I don't really think they're going to be a factor. And then, yeah, the Saints. No, the Buccaneers are winning the division. There's no, there's no doubt about that. And as for competition, well, there's one other team you forgot about, the Rams. No, I said the Rams. Or the, you did say the Rams. Sorry. Yeah, I, I mean, you look at the NFC East, and I, I don't know what Dallas is going to be. I think Philly had a very good draft line. I think Philly is poised to compete with Dallas for the NFC East. But I mean, probably going to be another year where it's the NFC least for all for all we know. I think the whole NFC in general is going to be least outside the NFC least. <laughs> and the fourth, or, it's not crazy to think the fifth team, the uh, fifth seed is going to be five hundred or worse. Yep, because just about how bad it is. I mean, you got all that talent out in the AFC, AFC West, and somebody's going to be set up for disappointment there. But you know, Brady going over to Fox. I mean, it could also be you know. Fox's decision to, you know, counter what like Tony Romo did over there, because you're looking now like the future of the NFL games. Now uh, you've got Nansen Romo at CBS. You're going to have Kevin Burkhart now being the number one guy. And he's going to do fantastic as being the lead guy with Tom Brady, whenever he decides to stop playing, you know, you've got Mike Tirico and Collinsworth at NBC. You've now got Buck and Aikman over on ESPN. And then when Amazon gets their deal, you're going to have Al Michaels and Kirk Herbstreet. So it's definitely, you know, the, the broadcasting landscape, in football has definitely changed. I mean, it's, it started a couple of years ago, but it's really going through that transformation now, especially when Buck and Aikman uh, headed to ESPN. Yeah. And by the way, if you're Kevin, if you're Kevin Burkhart, you must be really, you must really feel like you've been living the dream. I mean, you start off as you start off at what Steve Gelbs does now from the New York Mets, 
then you go to Fox, then you start to get promoted and do a lot of the big games for Fox. And now you might be one of the bigger guys and you get to join Tom Brady. I mean, does it get any better than that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I remember watching K, listening to KB. He used to be on WFAN. He started he was doing uh, sports updates there too. And then, you know, grad went up to SNY, like you said. So I feel like, you know, we saw his career uh, grow up now. And yeah, now he's the lead guy on for the football and also still does uh, – pre and post game for the world series on Fox. So it's a pretty awesome uh, accomplishment. And yeah, no, you got to have a lot of these different guys uh, in the broadcast booths in football with all these changes that are happening. Uh, so yeah, we'll have to get used to some different voices and different uh, combinations. I'm just curious to see who still is going to be uh, KB's uh, number one guy uh, this year, because obviously this only takes effect once uh, Brady retires. We don't know if Brady's going to play for a year or two. Um, I, I said that if Brady's coming back, he's coming back for more than one year. So it could be two years before we, uh, see this happening. By the way, it could be Greg Olson. I was just thinking because Burkhart and Olson did a lot of games together this year. So it could be Greg Olson that's, that, uh, heads into that number one spot, uh, along with KB. But yeah, it's, uh. I, you know, it's not really much of a surprise. Maybe just the news that it broke now, but maybe also that uh, you know Fox wanted to get ahead of, get ahead of this. Uh, also, the reports from Bleacher Report were saying that Brady's going to get between twenty and twenty five million dollars to uh, be the uh, guy. So he he said, and you know, he lo- he loves football. So you He's see, not even for the money. He, yeah, he loves the game. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Brady doesn't need the money. I mean, we know that. I mean, he's taking pay cuts to you know, stay in the league and help his teams win. And that's why Brady, that's part of the reason why Brady teams are so successful is because, you know, he doesn't command so much money and doesn't have a dead cap hit like a lot of these other guys do. I mean, you look at all these other quarterbacks that we've talked about, you know, before making the 40 to $50 million per year and how their dead cap money takes a tremendous hit to the team. So Brady, Brady's guys always have a chance because between the favorable divisions, you know, the, the play of Brady, obviously, and the fact that they have so much money to spend on other players, I mean, you're going to see them, you know, go out there. I, I think, I think Julio Jones is in play for the Bucks, even if it's not until later in the season. I think Gronkowski is going to come back for one more run too. I, I definitely do think that. So the, uh, so yes, yeah, so the sports media landscape is changing, especially in football, with with this happening, but. Yeah, not it wasn't really maybe just because it was announced so early, but I I thought Brady was a broadcaster. We'll find out how it how it works out. Yeah, definitely. I can't wait to see it. As I said, I think he's got the right personality to be a broadcaster, and he loves the game too. So, definitely. yeah, and 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 the quarterback position is is one of those things too because because you are leading the offense that it can work out well. You see a lot of these guys do that, so it will. Uh, We'll Makes sense out. as to why there have been a lot of quarterbacks that have been broadcasting historically. Well, it's like in baseball, you know, the, a lot of the cat, a lot of catchers become managers, so it it does make a whole, it does make a lot of sense, and it definitely will create a spark. I mean, I guess Fox also needed that too because you know losing Buck and Aikman. I mean, that is a a big blow to them, but you know, KB will step in just fine, and I think Brady at least gives them the name recognition for sure. That maybe that provides the spark. Hank, one big thing to watch also this week regarding the NFL, obviously, is the schedule release. And now we know of nine games as of this moment, but you know the full schedule is going to come out on Thursday, and we will react to that uh, next week. But you know we we know about three games in week two. You know we we knew during draft night that the Chargers and the Chiefs will be on Thursday night football, but then there was a Monday, there's going to be a Monday night football doubleheader: Titans, Bills, Vikings, Eagles on Monday night, and then the five international games, we know about the three London ones, the Vikings and the Saints, the Giants and Packers, the Jaguars and Broncos, and that Jaguars-Broncos game is going to be an ESPN Plus exclusive, which, you know, don't get me started about the whole streaming stuff. I mean, you know my feelings about that. But you've got that. You've got the, the first game in Germany between the Seahawks and the Bucks. That's going to happen in Week 10. And then also in Mexico, Cardinals 49ers, Monday Night Football Week 11. And then on Christmas, Broncos Rams, that's going to be on CBS and Nickelodeon. That was announced on Tuesday morning. So we already know about some. We know there's going to probably be some more that gets leaked out officially before uh, 
Thursday's official schedule release. But of those games, anything you want to take from it real quick? Uh, Yeah, I w- I'm really looking forward to seeing how NFL and London goes. I mean, I feel bad for those Packer fans who probably had that one as part of their season ticket plan and might have to fly up to London if they want to see the game. But yeah. you know what? I think it's going to get a lot of NFL ratings, so it definitely makes sense there. It sure will. And, you know, it, it does work over there in London. I mean, their whole goal behind that was to get an international spark, especially after NFL Europe, you know, which never really panned out to begin no. with. But, I, you know, I look at that as a Giants fan, and I'm like – Giants may have caught a break not having to worry about playing the Packers at Lambeau. So that's for yeah, sure. No. That really did catch my attention. We knew that the Bucks were going to be part of the first Germany game. Uh, so that that when that broke, that was like, okay, and playing the Seahawks. But uh, the one thing I, I'm looking at is, you know, Jaguars and Broncos, how that game's not going to be on TV. It's going to be an exclusive streaming game. And unfortunately, like I said, you know, it's a sign of the times. Not a fan of it, but, you know, it might be just the way we're going right now but yeah no a lot of these games are you know the giant I, I thought it was interesting the giants and the packers like i said you know i know the giants caught a break there but at the same time it's a that's a that's kind of a marquee matchup between two historical franchises and they're pinning that one in london so uh that one i thought was a little bit surprising but you know the nfl they, they always find a way to get this to do this stuff you know that'd the be, nfl yeah that's it but, uh, yeah, no, so it should be interesting. And I guess then we have a couple of seconds real quick. Mets and Yankees, you know, first teams to 20 wins in baseball this season. Uh, pretty pretty remarkable there. We'll have to see, we'll have to see if the trend continues. Uh, the, the, the pitching staffs on both ends have been fantastic. That's one thing that has been consistent so far this first month of the season. So I tell you, between that and, like, we spoke about last week with the Giants and the Jets and – you know, the Rangers still in it and stuff. I mean, it's a it's a fun time. Yeah, for sure. And hopefully the Rangers will be in it for longer than tomorrow. Keep my fingers crossed, knocking on wood. I know my track record at the Garden this year has been pretty good, but still. Absolutely. Knock on wood for that, Hank. Absolutely. Well, we'll find out what happens with the Rangers going forward. You know, the like I said, Stanley Cup playoffs still going on. We've got, you know, the NBA playoffs happening. We'll have the full schedule release out this Thursday in the NFL. And so we can react to that next week. Next week will be episode number 10 of Game On already. It's been going by fast, but it has been a blast. We are presented by Knack Bags. Uh, make sure, folks, uh, you can use the, K- the code GAME, G-A-M-E, at checkout and get a free TSA-approved lock with your Knack Bag of choice. And here is mine, by the way. This, this, this thing is absolutely fantastic. I use it a lot. Uh Definitely got it. You know, it's got a great inside to it. You know, it holds a lot of stuff. It converts into many different things. So we thank our our friends over at Knack for sponsoring not only uh, Game On, but also, you know, all of our Empty the Bench shows. And, of course, you know, if you follow us at ETB Network, you could see all of our shows that are happening. This network is growing, and it's a pleasure to be a part of it. So, uh, Hank, thanks again. It was another great show, as always. Folks, thanks well, a lot for guys. joining us. Absolutely. And, you know, folks, thanks again for joining. Uh, Keep it locked in here to the Empty the Bench Podcast Network for all your shows and stuff. And we will be back with for episode 10 of Game On next week.